Perfect. All right. So um, just a bit of background about myself really quickly. Um, my name's Matthew Varley. I'm from Melbourne, um, currently back in Melbourne, uh, working at La Trobe University in the sport and exercise science discipline. Um, I'm really going to talk a lot about what my research is focused on today, which is athlete monitoring and team sport, but particularly around the technology, the metrics and the methods that we use, and then being able to give meaning to that. Um, so I'll jump straight into it just because I know that I ramble and I don't have too much time. So just to make sure you guys have a face to put to a name, I thought I'd, I'd put my picture there. Although given that we are um, in not quite a lockdown yet in, in Melbourne, but we are working from home, probably this picture is a bit more representative at the moment. I don't necessarily have kids to deal with, but I do have a, a cat that I've got to deal with on a daily basis. To give you an overview of my presentation, what I'm going to go through, we're going to start with metrics. And by that, I mean physical metrics that we divide, um, get from our athlete tracking technology. Look at what they are, what they represent, and then move on to more of a method. So how do we define these metrics through data filtering and data processing? And then I want to end with providing meaning to these metrics. So how can we understand them better? And, and something that I'm really keen on is understanding these through context and through vision. So I'm sure you've all seen the background of athlete monitoring technology. You know, um, I still find it amusing to show this picture of the old school way that we'd look at measuring athlete distance covered. So notational analysis, we'd have someone sitting on the sidelines and they'd just be annotating a symbol um, whenever they thought that subjectively uh, the player has sprinted, jogged, walked five yards. Um, fast forward 40 plus years in the future and we've got a range of technologies at our disposal. Inertial sensors that have GPS, accelerometer, magnetometer, gyroscopes, we've got our optical tracking systems, our LPS systems um, and more. One thing I really want to um, point out up front is I'm actually not going to talk about validity and reliability in the study for a couple of reasons. The first one is um, James Malone's going to talk about that a little bit more later on uh, this evening. Um, and I really wanted to focus on more on the metrics that we use, but I do want to stress that validity and reliability is really important and really critical in what we do. Um, that said, once we have looked at the validity and reliability of a device, it doesn't always then relate to the further data processing we may do when we determine the metrics that we use. Uh, the other side of this is regardless of what information we release, often clubs will use the devices that they have. So it is a two-step process. You do need to do your validity reliability, but you also need to understand um, how you're looking at the metrics that you're looking at. So for this talk, I'm just going to use GPS as an example. The concepts I talk about, though, are relevant to all types of athlete tracking technology we can use. Um, but I didn't want to make it too long, so we're just going to focus on the GPS side of things. So if we look at our GPS units, which receive signals from satellites orbiting the Earth, what does this technology quantify? Well, we get positional data, so our latitude and longitude. We get distance, which is determined through positional differentiation. So we look at that change from latitude, longitude, A to B, and we can then work out the distance that the device has moved. We get velocity, which is calculated by the Doppler shift method, which is a way of calculating velocity by measuring the change in the frequency of the satellite signals. I want to make this very clear though, but there's another way we could get velocity, which is via distance. When we look at velocity via GPS, it is generally not as a derivative of distance. And this is important because we need to understand that our velocity and hence our acceleration measures are independent of our different uh, distance measures. So we have velocity there that's calculated via Doppler shift. And then we have acceleration, which is a derivative of velocity. Now, other measures that we can get relate to data quality. Um, so we can get a recording of the number of satellites available. We want at least four to get positional data. Um, the recommendation is to have at least six available when we're collecting data. Horizontal dilution of precision. So this is a measure of the accuracy of the GPS horizontal positional signal based on the geometrical organization of the satellites. Typically, we just want to have a HDOP less than one, which would be ideal. The other way we can measure our data quality is just by visually checking it, looking for spikes in our data for dropout and so on. Okay, so, so the, this is what the technology provides. Now, when I'm talking about metrics today, I'm talking about physical metrics, and you'll be familiar with the majority of these. So we've got all our different um, speed zones, 
and distances that we cover in that. So high speed running, very high speed running, sprinting, and as you can see, a whole range of thresholds have been used. Now we can then categorize these um, and typically the, the, these categories into an overall zone, which was originally referred to as high intensity running, but I'll talk about this later. Um, we've kind of had a shift in that terminology and it's now total high speed running. And then in addition to this, we have other movement descriptors such as accelerations and decelerations. Now there's a lot more thresholds that have been used to define these. I've just put a few examples there. And then other measures such as change of direction, player load, even quantifying the amount of jumps a player is doing. Now, now these three are probably more from an accelerometer than a GPS, um, but I just thought worth mentioning there. So once we have these metrics, we can then report them in a number of different ways. Typically, we look at the distance covered, um, we could look at the number of efforts, or we could look at the duration we're spending in each of these speeds um, or movements. So if we then think what we're actually reporting on, um, this will be familiar to most of you who've worked with GPS devices before. It represents 45 minutes of a game of football. Now, just to clarify, being Australian, when I say football, I do mean association football. The rest of Australia probably won't like it, me for it, but that's football to me. Um, so you can see that there's velocity um, on one axis and GPS time on the other, 45 minute game. And it's quite complex then having to go through that data and fish out what we want and how we're going to define the metrics that we want to pull out from that. Some are easier than others. You can see there, high speed running, maybe anything above that red line, sprinting, anything above that line at the top, but the complexities go on and on. So I want to briefly discuss some of the commonly used physical metrics, what they represent and some considerations surrounding them. In particular, while I'm talking about this, I want you to think of the coaches and support staff that you work with um, who may be less familiar with these metrics um, than we are and consider what may come to their mind when they try and visualise this information. So let's start with sprinting. Often when we think of sprinting, we think of sprint testing, which is usually represented by a maximal effort over a given distance from a static start. Ideally, these tests can provide a measure of acceleration capacity over five to 10 meters, and then maximal sprint speed could be determined via the fastest split over the test. Now, typically, I know this pitch is only showing 30 meters, but for maximal sprint speed, we'd really wanna be looking at at least a 40 meter test, if not further. Um, from an athlete tracking perspective, however, sprinting is typically defined as the movement above a fixed relative or absolute threshold so in this example i've used seven meters per second so what this means is when we refer to sprinting in terms of athlete tracking we're not incorporating the acceleration component but we're simply talking about the time when the player is running above this threshold now that can add a whole lot of complexities to a coach when we try and refer to them on this is a sprinting that a player did in a match because they may straight away think of sprinting how we define it under testing from a static start. So this has a few important considerations. The first is that typical sprint distances that we would report um, and efforts don't include that acceleration component. So if we say someone sprinted for 10 meters, it's not a 10 meter testing sprint, it's 10 meters above seven meters per second. And maybe that's why traditionally people have used much shorter um, distances such as 20 meters in their attempts to work out your, your sprint testing. Um, so what this also tells us then is that to assess maximal speed, we do need larger distances that incorporate that time or lead in to the sprint, um, reaching that sprint threshold itself. Now, I just wanna note here, I'm actually quite supportive of the assessment of maximal sprint speed being conducted via GPS. And some of the work that Gregory Rose done recently shown that GPS seems to be um, quite, quite, accurate and being able to determine that maximal sprint speed. The benefit of this is you can get your um, maximal sprint speed more often. You can incorporate it into testing. You're not limited by um, some distances. You could get your uh, athletes running 60 meters plus in their warm up. Um, and ultimately, if you're gonna use that maximal sprint speed to determine relative thresholds, the important thing here is you're actually recording maximal sprint speed on the same device you're gonna be incorporating those thresholds onto. So the next metric I wanna talk about is high speed running. Um, again, I've just picked the arbitrary threshold here of around about four, 4.17 meters per second. So what this means is high speed running, again, is anything above the line. Now, as I mentioned earlier, traditionally, high speed running um, was used to represent high intensity activity. However, if we start to look at an acceleration, 
we know that the highest rate of acceleration can occur at a low velocity. We also know that accelerating is an energetically demanding task. So if we, the consideration here is, if we only considered high speed running as high intensity activity, we'd actually underestimate the high intensity activity being performed because we're not incorporating these acceleration efforts. So it also gives rise to quantifying accelerations and then ultimately decelerations um, to be able to try provide a pr true representation of high intensity activity. So the final metric I'll cover today is acceleration. You can see I've, I've just picked again three meters per second squared as an arbitrary threshold to use. So what this means, if we look at our graph, is that an acceleration, if we were going to quantify it as an effort, um, would be anything above three meters per second until acceleration drops back below this, um, this threshold. So what does this tell us? Well, this maximal acceleration, if we're quantifying this effort in this way, is very, very short. But another consideration, which I'll get back to later on, is that you can see that even though we're no longer accelerating above our threshold, we are still accelerating um, as we're approaching our maximal speed. And I think this is an important consideration when we think of the different ways we may want to look at our metrics. And I'll come back to this you know, in a couple of slides time. So the second part of my talk is really on how these metrics are defined. Why do I think this is so important? Well, we get our devices, you can see our GPS there, and pretty much we analyze it in some way, whether we use manufacturer software or we, we export the data ourselves and analyze it um, in a whole range of different programs and platforms. And then we have our metric of interest. What are some of the considerations though we need to account for when we're defining these metrics? I think, I think there's really three main ones. Threshold selection, data filtering, and effort detection. Now, I'm not actually going to talk about threshold selection uh, in this talk today. I think a lot of others will cover it over the course of this webinar, but I really want to focus on data filtering and effort detection because they do seem to get um, the least attention um, across practitioners and researchers. So again, rather than go through each individual metric, I've just picked out one to use as an example, in this case, acceleration efforts. But what I talk about in regards to determining acceleration efforts, the same um, framework really should be applied to all metrics that people uh, want to look at. So let's start off with data filtering. So as I mentioned before, acceleration from a GPS anyway is derived from velocity. And there's a range of different filters that can then be applied when we're um, calculating acceleration. So if we look at our GPS data, you can see here that this is 10 hertz data. So we're getting um, 10 samples a second. You can see velocity there in meters per second, and this is velocity derived by vo uh, Doppler shift. So if we then wanted to determine acceleration, we can just do that by, uh, in its rawest form, calculating acceleration over a 0.2 second interval. So we look at the change in velocity over the change in time, sample to sample. However, this can be quite noisy. So what we often do when we're filtering, and this is a really crude way of filtering, would be just to widen that interval which we're calculating acceleration over. So we could do it over 0.3 seconds or 0.4 seconds or so on. Now, there are a lot more sophisticated filters that people are using, could be an exponential filter, could be a five point moving filter. Um, and, and what these actually look like, if we then take our um, 40 meter sprint in this case, and we overlay acceleration where we've just calculated over a 0.2 second interval, what you can see is as we widen that interval, we smooth our data. And this is important because as you can see, there's a lot of spikes in our acceleration. It's quite noisy, but when we need to know what the right level of data filtering is here. The other thing that's important with defi uh, our definitions are effort detection. Okay, and what I mean by this, typically with acceleration efforts or sprint efforts is something that's often been referred to as a minimum effort duration or a dwell time. So what this is, if we put a acceleration threshold, this time just two, uh, anything above two meters per second squared. So anything above that line would represent our acceleration effort. The minimum effort duration is a minimum duration above this threshold that's required for an effort to be recorded. So it, it can be anywhere between 0.2 to one second. Um, I haven't really seen people go above one second. What this means, if we look at the data on the screen, we would be able to identify, if we were using something like a 0.2 minimum effort duration, we would have three separate accelerations. Now this is important um, because this is only across a space of 1.4 seconds. 
A consideration I think is often neglected is also deciding on a minimum duration, which um, our accelerations fall below that threshold. So if you look at the example on the screen, we've got two situations where our accelerations is dropping below threshold for 0.1 and then 0.2 of a second. So if we had a minimum duration of say 0.3 or 0.4 that we had to drop below that threshold, instead of having three separate accelerations, we'd just be reporting on one. This is also important when we start to consider our running thresholds. So if we take a high speed running effort, you can see there um, only one effort detected because it's only gone above threshold um, for a certain amount of time. But again, even with our velocity, especially if we're oscillating around a certain speed with high speed running or sprinting, it becomes really important that we're addressing this minimum duration for an end point too. Um, otherwise, what's clearly one high speed running effort becomes two. Now, minimum effort duration is one way of doing this. You could also look at um, saying that it, um, your velocity or acceleration would need to dip below the threshold for a certain percentage of your, of your um, set threshold. There's a whole range of do ways of doing this, but it is something that needs to be considered. So I really want to now show you guys the implications that both data filtering and effort detection can have on the number of efforts that are recorded in a typical game. So, this is some research um, that my colleagues James Malone, who will speak later tonight, Arnie Jaspers and Werner Helsen conducted, um, where we took GPS game data from all players during a 90 minute football match, and we applied a range of different filters and minimum effort durations to the same set of data. So you can see that there's three different graphs on the screen, which all have the number of acceleration efforts detected on the y-axis and a range of minimum effort durations along the x-axis, ranging from 0.2 through to one second. In regards to data filtering, the graph on the left used the old catapult sprint software where accelerations were derived from velocity over a 0.2 second interval. The middle graph used a 0.3 second interval and the right graph used a newer open field software which actually calculates acceleration using an exponential filter. So if we start off by looking at the effect of different filtering um, types and we just pick one of those minimum effort durations, say 0.3 seconds, you can see that the different types of filters each provided very different results in the total number of efforts detected during a game, going from 175 efforts to 120 to 15. So really big differences there. It's also really clear, I don't even need to highlight anything here, that the, um, the, minimum, the different minimum effort durations also resulted in very different numbers of efforts being detected um, within each of the data filtering types as well. Um, so one of the questions we often get from this is what, what do we then recommend? Well, unfortunately, like a lot of things in sports science, it's not that black and white. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of gray and I don't think there is a straightforward answer to this. At the moment, I think there's really um, a few choices, but they have important considerations. One of them could be that you decide to use a small minimum effort duration, which will likely capture all the real accelerations, but it will also contain efforts that are not real. So you'll have a bit of noise there. Alternatively, you could be really conservative um, and go for a much larger minimum effort duration. You've then got confidence that any efforts detected are most likely real, but you've got to come to the understanding that you're probably going to miss quite a few efforts as well. Um, the best choice may be picking something in the middle um, where you are going to have less noise um, and more, more real efforts. But I still think you can't avoid that underestimation or overestimation of efforts. Ultimately, from my recommendation is to actually link the way you're defining these movements to video so that you can clearly see and understand the metrics that you, um, that you look at given the way that you're defining, um, defining your different metrics here. So the one last thing I want to talk about and how we define our metrics are the different methods that we can use. And, and I'm quite big on this. I don't believe that there's typically a right way or a wrong way to do things, as long as we can have a method that we can justify and it addresses the question that we're actually asking. So we go back to our acceleration and we can see that the, the, the main method that would get used is we're identifying accelerations when it's above threshold and it finishes when it drops below threshold. And again, thinking back to what a coach or support staff might think this looks like visually, it's quite short, so it might just be something like this. And that might not be what they're expecting. 
they might not think that, okay, when you say they've done an acceleration effort, you're only really talking about one or two steps. So as I mentioned before, we've also got um, the fact that after this maximal acceleration or this acceleration effort, we do continue to accelerate um, as we're increasing speed. Um, it's just not at that maximal rate. It's not above the threshold. So another method could be that we still identify this hard acceleration when it goes above the threshold, but we don't identify the end point until acceleration is either negative or zero. Now what this would look like may be more in line with what a coach um, or any individual may think when you're talking about an acceleration effort. These alternative methods are fine. I don't think one's right and one's wrong, but you need justification for the approach you're taking. And as I said, you need to know um, what do you want this to be able to answer? So for example, this second approach, I wouldn't really look at from a uh, workload point of view. I would look at it if I wanted to know about an acceleration effort and try and give it context in terms of match actions or technical um, factors that people are performing. So the final thing I want to stress on why I think understanding how we define our metrics is, is so important really comes, um, it, it's summed up nicely by a systematic review that Damien Harper, um, Chris Carling and John Keeley actually um, published last year. So in this review, they looked at high intensity accelerations and decelerations um, from studies that had investigated this with elite team sport athletes. Um, after their exclusion criteria, they came away with 17 studies where these efforts were reported um, from a range of different sports. Now, I've just picked two out to show you here from Australian football. And you can see these two different studies, they've used the same sport. They're reporting the number of accelerations over the course of a game, absolute values. They've used the same threshold, yet it's clear that they've got vastly different numbers there. One's much higher than the other. Now, for me, this makes sense. I'm able to read through the methodology of these studies and I look at the top study and they used a minimum effort duration of 0.2 seconds. They also analyzed the raw data, whereas the bottom study used the manufacturer's software. So when I'm, in, I'm interpreting this, I'm not gonna think, well, they must have used one team that clearly accelerates a lot more than the other. By knowing what or how they've defined their metrics, it can actually explain the difference in the results there. Now, the other thing that's really important from this study out of those 17 articles that they looked at, only six articles actually detailed the minimum effort duration. Of those 17 studies, only three of them actually reported the number of satellites available and only one study reported the horizontal dilution of precision. So this is really critical that we understand this both from a practice and a research point of view. And we include this information so that others can not just um, explain differences when they're comparing our studies to others, but they can also reproduce our studies and our research should be reprodu reproducible. So I now want to move on to the last part of my study, which is then providing meaning to these metrics. Again, I think the best way for someone to understand what a metric actually represents is by linking it to video. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're all really familiar with the sentence here. I've seen it in so many different introductions to match analysis research. Uh, it says that sprints and accelerations are thought to be important in football as they allow players to be the first to the ball, move past an opponent and create or stop goal scoring opportunities. And I'm sure this is important, but I just want to play two videos for you. So you can see in the two videos, we've got the one on the, on the, um, on the left where the current best team in the world gets away from the, the opposition, sprints towards goal and scores. Now to the right, you see the player sprinting. Now you may have missed it, but he actually scored his goal about six seconds ago. And he's just sprinted the length of the pitch to celebrate in front of the team that he used to play for. So yes, sprinting was important in the context for the pitcher on the left, but how important was it in the pitcher on the right? Now, okay, goals might not be that frequent, but if we think of a different sport, such as Australian rules football, where you have player rotations and often players will sprint off the pitch when they rotate. So if a player has seven or eight sprints a game, seven or eight of those reported sprints that they've conducted in the game are just them moving on and off the pitch. So again, yes, it's important from a workload perspective, but if we want to link it to importance of critical match actions, you know, we really need to have some context and some vision to make this clearer. So 
we tried to look at this, so we started to look at this quite a few years ago with my um, my current PhD student, uh, Cody Moran, um, during his honours year, where we actually worked with Football Victoria. And over the course of a season, we started to link together the video with the actual movements that we thought that the players were doing, um, leading up to certain match actions or scenarios. So in this case, we're looking at the roughly 10 seconds before a player has a shot on goal. And what we wanted to see was, when they had a shot or goal, we can relate it to a successful or an unsuccessful outcome. So they're either on target, off target, or ultimately they score a goal. Did we tend to see that they were sprinting more often? Were they accelerating more often? Uh, though I don't necessarily measure decelerations yet, it would be very interesting to see if prior to their shot at goal, if they actually decelerate, so they have time to position the ball. Um, what this information can actually do practically is provide coaches and support staff with that visualization of the performance metrics that we're often reporting to them. It can lead to match action specific training. So, you know, when you are training for a certain phase of play, do those training drills actually reflect the physical movements that you're going to be performing during a match? You could also use this to give individual feedback to players. We know that within positions, you could have two forwards who have a very different approach. So does one forward tend to get into more goal scoring opportunities following a sprint that, that allows them to get into space? Does the tall forward actually not really sprint much at all? So we can use this information to see how they play in relation to these critical events happening all over the pitch. This work was actually started quite a while ago um, by Oliver Feld, who looked at um, videos of the Bundesliga games and then they subjectively determined whether a player was sprinting or not, leading into goal scoring situations. I'm still amazed that this paper, which was published in 2012, is one of the only ones which has really linked actions immediately before these type of events. And when I mean immediately before, I'm not talking about 15 minute periods or five minute periods because we know how much football can change in a short amount of time. I'm talking about finding a specific action we want to look at and looking at three, five or 10 seconds before that. So I think there's a bit more of this research um, that's, that's needed. I really wanted to show everyone this video. One, one reason was it was some fantastic work by uh, Joey Harrings, who's a data scientist for Top Sports Labs. So, so what he managed to put together here was perfect to be able to show people what our metrics may actually mean. So you can see in the top left corner, we have video of the game. We've got an um, animated representation of players and, and their numbers and the pitch off to the right. And then underneath, we have speed, acceleration, deceleration, and change of direction, which is moving in real time with the video. Now that red X on the screen is actually a player about to get injured. Now it's the bottom right player, player three. And if we watch them, we can actually track the moment that they pass the ball and they pull up injured holding their hamstring. Now we can then look at the graph and we can see, well, okay, as soon as they got injured, they decelerated. Well, that makes sense. That probably happened after they got injured. But it could also provide more information to help us understand some of the um, movements that may be inciting events leading into injury. Not all injury because people may have um, injuries going into the game, but it does allow us to understand what's happening in a little bit more detail. And so while this can be used for injury as well, I think, you know, as I've mentioned before, the technical aspects of the game, it's just as critical. But really, it's linking the physical and the visual. So I want to sum up my take home messages to you guys. Um, the main one is understand your metrics, know what they represent. I think this one's really important. Know, consider and explain how your metrics are defined. You know, especially if you're going to publish it, your work should be reproducible. So you need to provide that detail. And that falls on both the author, but also the reviewer. If you're reviewing a paper, you need to ask the authors to put this information in. It's really important so that we can then compare their data to others, but also we can reproduce or understand what they're doing. Alternative approaches to how you define your metrics are completely fine. There is not just one way of doing things, but you need justification on why you're doing it. And you need to be able to think clearly on what question you want to answer given your current method. And then finally, once we start to sort all that out, we can then provide meaning to our metrics. Really, I think visualization is the key. A lot of tracking companies are really starting to embed that video link up into their software anyway. And then we can start to see some really cool, um, both practical applied research um, and, and just 
practice linking physical movements to these actions and events. So I just wanted to finish up with giving you guys an overview of what we're doing over at Latrobe in the sports and exercise science discipline um, down in Melbourne. So you can see the picture there. Um, we've, we've just completed a brand new sports park, um, contains six basketball courts. It's got world-class biomechanics, strength and conditioning and physiology labs. On our back doorstep, we've got a synthetic um, football pitch, we've got the AFL oval, we've got a baseball diamond and we've got more pitches um, a bit further in the distance. It's the perfect opportunity for us to be really starting to look at all these different um, ways to monitor our athletes um, in, our, in our living lab. So we're, we're really excited that that's just up and running. The kind of work that we're going to be doing over the next few years, uh, really looking at exploring the data processing that's involved in determining high intensity movements. I really want to be able to confidently quantify acceleration, moving on to deceleration and then ultimately change of direction and be able to provide a clear visualization of these metrics to coaches and support staff. Even if that doesn't fall under the research category, it is critical that people can visualize these movements. That Following that, as I said, way, physical, sorry. I was just saying that looks incredible. I'm getting uh, messages from Warren Gregson to say, cut you off now. He's speaking about He, he would say that, that, wouldn't he, sitting there in his pajamas? <laughs> um, no speedos he did yeah. say speedos speedos sorry so uh, yeah just just to wrap it up the physical technical looking at those relationships and and events that are immediately preceding injury um other than that you know working with you guys all over the world this is online friendly research so really getting involved with all the clubs most of the work we're doing is collaborating with people like steve um james who are overseas so these collaborations are only an email away. So if you have any questions about this or you've got anything you want us to look at or help you with, just shoot us an email, you know, at Latrobe, we're more than happy to help. So thank you for listening.